John Felipelli, great to see you. I love the jerseys behind you. Uh, Mariano Rivera, Rivera is, to me, the greatest baseball player of all time because of what he did so consistently. But we're here to talk about another Hall of Famer, and that is you. Um, Hi, Kenny. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. So I wanted to kind of give you a chance to talk a little bit. You know, we're looking at these as deep dives, so some sort of, like, deep cut that you wouldn't necessarily tell on the stage during the Hall of Fame ceremony next year. So... Um, let's start with, you know, how did you kind of get into this business um, of baseball production? I, uh, I, I took the tour of NBC, and it's uh, like 1974, and um, I, I said, what a, this is so fabulous. I so enjoyed the tour. Either I had a great tour guide, which I'm sure I did, but I, I was so smitten. At, it was like love at first sight. And I said, I, I'm going to get a job here. So I said, like, it's like, it's not today where you have all the security and you can't, you know, go from point A to point B because of the, the world situation. Uh, it is, uh, it was, uh, it was free. So I walked around from office to office. I said, hi, I'm, I'm John Filippelli. I like a job. And they'd say to me, uh, you have credentials? I was like, no. <laughs> Do you have a degree? No. Do you have? No. I didn't know. I answered no. Like every, I checked every box. No. And uh, they said, well, fill out this form and you'll send it personnel. And. I, I always knew that that wasn't going to get me. That that was a difficult procedure. I, I preferred face to face. So right. I, I walked around, walked around, and, uh, and eventually I wound up in the wire room, which is where the copy boys were. And they would take the teletype. The job was basically to handle a teletype machine. So that you know they would take the stories that used for UPI AP Reuters. You'd rip them off. You put them on a hook, and whoever was the the person in the newsroom that uh, needed the stories, they would go check their corresponding hook. Right. That was basically the essence of the job. Okay. So, but, uh, so I, they said it's four to midnight on weekends and it's kind of dead end. I said, I'll take it. And so what I did was work every shift, but everybody called in sick. They always knew to call me. I did every shift possible because I wanted to learn. I wanted to get, really wanted to know the business. And I would start to take stories, sports stories as they came on the wire. And I would point it out to the different writers and correspondents back then and uh, reporters who would come into looking for their sports stories. I'd say, you see, see that strike today on 18 strikeouts last night? He's the lefty for the Angels at Newport Beach. And it's, I would point them to, and they, after a while, they would come to me and say, hey, what you got? So I would help them do their do their stories. So uh, one day, one of, the, one of the guys down in sports said to me, you should be in a sports department. I said, I would really love that. So I said, I'll introduce you to, you know, Scotty. And so I met Scotty Connell, who was great. Yeah. And uh, there, there had to be an opening for like an NAPPA. And uh, so I had I passed muster with him. Then I go see Chet, uh, Chet Simmons, who was president of NBC Sports. And he says to me, um, uh, why should I hire you? I said, because I'm good and I work hard and I, I know I could do this. And he says to me, well, that's fine. But I get 100 people a week telling me they could and they can handle this. And, you know, they have the background or whatever. He says, you really know sports? I said, I really do. He says, you know baseball? I said, like the back of my hand. And he says to me, all right. Can you, you, can you name the starting lineup of the 1961 Yankees? And I said, I'll do one better. I'll name the whole team. If I name the whole team, will you give me a job? He says, if you name the whole team, do I, will I give you a job? He goes, you can't name the whole team. I said, I can't. He says to me, all right, well, if you name the whole team, will you give me a job? I said, okay, great. So yeah, I said, all right. Bill Scourd was at first base. Bobby Richardson was second. Tony Kubik was at short. Cleet Boyd was at third. Elston Howard, Yogi Berra, Johnny Blanchard split the catching duties. That's actually Blanchard played a little. Phil Hector Lopez, uh, Roger Maris, Ricky Mantle, Whitey Ford, Bill Stafford, uh, Ralph Terry, Louis Royal. I mean, I went to the whole thing. And, and he said, um, uh, how did you know that? I said, I, I know it. And I told my dad, ran a bar across the street from Evansfield. I grew up with baseball. Uh, and I used to say, you know, Jackie Robinson, Carl Perillo, Preacher Rowe, you know, uh, Roy Campanella, Hodges, Joe, uh, Joe Black, all those people would come in my dad's bar. So I got to very early education on baseball and I, I grew up loving it and that was able to translate to a great passion. And I eventually got me a job at NBC and that's how I started and met Mike Weissman, who was absolutely great to me and uh, about doing Junior Olympics and things with him and you know, I, I basically became his AD for a while, and I learned so much from Michael. He's one of the great producers, live producers of all time, and I'm yep. so happy to join him in the Hall of Fame. It means a lot to me, but uh, but that's how I got my start. That's great, great. So uh, obviously you have a Dodger connection because you also want to discuss the Kirk Gibson home run, which I think we all remember that. Um, so uh, did, that, uh, you were not a Los Angeles Dodgers, Dodgers fan, though, right? No. Did you see the so – I'm panning this way. I'm yeah. looking for Sandy Koufax. He's somewhere – 
You see Sandy Koufax somewhere? Yep. Yeah, there he is. There he is, yeah. Sandy up there. Uh, 32? Yep. Yeah, there he is. Um, so, yes, I still, yes, I, yes, I had that big connection. And, uh, but, and I was, fast forward, it's like 1988, I'm producing the World Series. Mike Weissman is the EP, and it's game one. It's a famous game one. It's the Gibson game. And we had done, you know, this, Gibson was the best player the Dodgers had. He was this, probably their singular most uh, you know, offensive player. Uh, right. and, and, but he was hurt. And no one thought he was going to play game one. That was the big story. And, and Costas, who was doing the pregame show about Costas, uh, went to great detail in the pregame show. And we won't see Kurt Gibson. We're not going to see Gibson. Right. And, uh, and that we just assumed that that was the case. So, uh, you know, come around, the, I guess, around the bottom of the seventh, maybe top of the eighth. Uh, Costas gets on the PL because Costas was in the Dodger dugout. He was serving as an on field reporter for us back then. And he told uh, myself and Mike Weissman and Harry Coyle um, that, uh, uh, you know, Gibson was starting to take swings down the tunnel. And you could actually hear over the PL, you hear thwack, thwack, thwack. And you actually hear the grunting. You'd, oh, Oh, you, I mean, Gibson was in really bad shape. He, right. The fact that he could do that was kind of amazing. And, and even then, we didn't think he'd come up to hit because you, you could hear the agony in his voice. Um, right. So, right. you know, so Vinny was doing a masterful job, as Vinny always did, Vince Scully. Uh, and he said he was talking about, you know, it would be interesting if we saw Kurt Gibson. But who knows that we'll see Gibson. We had an idea, you could, but we didn't really know. We Honestly, we really didn't know. Uh, but uh, so but down with, now we get to the bottom of the ninth and who comes out? Here comes Gibson. We you know two up to pinch hit. And uh, so uh, he, he's throwing up to the plate. Vinny did a great job of describing it all, putting it yeah, in front of it all. And, uh, you know, and, you know, Gibson's up there and he's fouling pitches off. And you can see him. He's grabbing his side. He's grunting. I mean, if, if, if Dennis Eckersley had thrown him a fastball, there was no way Gibson, and he, Eckersley was in his prime. He was a great reliever then. There right. was no way that he would have gotten <clears> him. You know, but he, he decided to throw him a backdoor slider, which sped up Gibson's bat a little bit, but still at all. Gibson swung, he hit him one-handed, and, yep. and, and off it goes. And, you know, Vinny says, you know, in the year of the improbable, the impossible has happened. It was really a great call. Yeah. And uh, yeah. great call. You know, and by the way, I mean, and 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 Joe Buck did a uh, – uh, Jack Buck, uh, Joe's father, did a, did a tremendous job with, you know, I don't believe what I just saw. Right. And, I mean, two of the great calls in, in World Series history. On one so, play. <laughs> right. And so so there comes in Gibson. He's just going around the bases. And he gets to second base. He does that famous fist pump when he gets to second base. Great directing by Harry Coyle, another Hall of Famer, who decided just to stay on Gibson. If it had been today, people would have been all over the place. Fans doing this, doing that. But, you know, Harry, for, and I worked with Harry a lot of years. I never saw him stay on a singular player on, on a home run. Never. And right. I mean, that moment, for whatever reason, he did it. And it became that fist pump is one of the great shots of World Series history. And, uh, you know, I credit Harry Coyle with that. And, you know, and, and you know, and Mike Weissman for staying on stuff. And, and Costas was great. Revealed. So start thinking about it. You had Harry Coyle, Hall of Famer, Mike Weissman, Hall of Famer, Bob Costas, Hall of Famer. And now I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to join that, that group. And from that truck, you wound up with all these Hall of Famers. It's quite, and, and Vince Scully, Scott Vinny, he's a Hall of Famer. So right. I mean, quite a collection of Hall of Famers. It was it was a great moment. We held off on replays, you know, until we tried to take the moment as long as we could, uh, and uh, and the replays were, were solid. And and uh, you know, it was like I said, one of the most iconic moments in World Series history. And it was a, one of the great moments, uh, certainly in my career, to be involved in. Yeah, it's great. And it's interesting that you know the that reaction, getting that reaction shot, probably ties back to the shot of uh, Fisk in '76, right? It's sort of like. You realize that then to capture those moments after the home runs. So then when you get to that game 12 years later, you're like, well, we got to make sure we have somebody, you know, it's just interesting to see the evolution and how it got, you know, the game keeps getting more replays, more cameras, because you don't want to miss those moments, which you just don't know where they're going to happen. And the fist thing is fascinating because no one knew the NBC truck. No one knew that they had it. Right. I mean, it just didn't. I mean, the, you know, the Cap Lou Gerard got the shot sort of by accident and, uh, and it wasn't in, Harry, in Roy Hammerman, who was the producer, and Harry was the director. Uh, they didn't, uh, even though they were hitting take me lights, they were doing other replays. They just didn't see the take me lights. And eventually, they, uh, they somebody said, "Hey, look at this! Look at what we got here!" And you know, they got it on. And uh, and obviously, one of the great moments. That another great moment of World Series history. Yep. You know, so yeah, you know, all great things. Well, Flip, so great to see you. Nice Look forward to seeing you. you next year in person. 
at the ceremony. This vaccine looks like it's going to happen. So I'm much more optimistic that by next December, we'll be in good shape. So, so great to see you as always. And uh, go Yankees. Same. Thanks, Kenny. And uh, my best to everybody at SVG. Awesome. Thanks, John. Bye-bye.